really important is that when we're talking about the, the average of about five liters of blood in an adult, that we understand what this blood is made up of. And if we look at learning objective uh, three, uh, uh, 11.3, and in figure 11.1, we see the components of blood. And so if you look at a simple centrifuge blood specimen of whole blood, you'd see how it separates out into plasma and the formed elements. Plasma would be the clear straw colored portion that's lighter and the heavier red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets would form down at the bottom. And plasma makes up about 55% of blood. Therefore, the formed elements make up about 45%. And plasma is mostly made of water. So, if it's about 90% water, as that diagram shows, if a person has high blood pressure, then probably the first line medication against high blood pressure would be a water pill, a diuretic, to get them to diurese, which is to produce urine. And that urine production would get rid of water. When the body loses total body water, well, where does a lot of that water come from? Blood volume or plasma volume. And that means that the person has less overall water in their whole blood. That means, therefore, that there's less pressure up against the artery walls and blood pressure drops. Now, the formed elements are going to be our red blood cells, which are very numerous, white blood cells, which are considerably less numerous than red blood cells, and then platelets. And platelets are not going to be quite as numerous as red blood cells, but more numerous than white blood cells. So those are our main components of blood. And again, plasma is going to be made up mostly of water. It's the biggest part of whole blood. And what isn't made up of water is typically made up of proteins, albumin, globulin, and fibrinogen. Um, those are going to be proteins that are constantly circul circulating in the plasma. And then we also in the plasma find nutrients, um, sugar, for example waste products, uh, like urea, for example, hormones, all hormones get released into the bloodstream. Enzymes can also be found in the bloodstream. So that's what makes up our plasma volume. But again, 90 or better percent, all water. Now, when we look down here, uh, our word bank, albumin, uh, Latin is white of an egg. And you typically think of what, uh, when you crack the egg open and get the egg white, that's the albumin. Uh, a simple soluble protein. It's a building block, in other words. Colloidal, or excuse me, colloid. Liquid containing suspended particles. Corpuscle, a blood cell. You may hear a renal corpuscle or something along those lines, and they're talking about something that holds blood cells. Uh, corpuscular, pertaining to the corpuscle or red cell, or blood cell, I should say. Ferritin. Anytime you see F-E-R-R, -R, that's going to mean iron. Um, iron protein complex, it regulates iron storage and transport. Fibrin, a stringy protein fiber that is a component of a blood clot. Fibrinogen, a precursor of fibrin in blood clotting process. Globulin. Okay, a family of blood proteins. And hematocrit, a test that you'll commonly see when you're abstracting information. Percentage of red blood cells in the blood. Hematology, the medical specialty of disorders of the blood. Hematologist, specialist in hematology. Hematocrit, or excuse me, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, that's the reg, reg, red pigmented protein that's the main component of red blood cells. If somebody has low iron content, they'll kind of have a gray look to them because the hemoglobin gives red blood cells a cherry red appearance. If they're lacking in iron and therefore their hemoglobin count is low, their skin will take on a pale ashy look to it 
because it doesn't have circulating through all the miles and miles and miles of capillaries just beneath the skin, it doesn't have those red blood cells fully engorged with hemoglobin. Hypochromic, and that's where we come into that term, pale in color as in red blood cells when hemoglobin is deficient. Those hypochromic red blood cells, again, lacking that cherry red color of a cell full of hemoglobin, gives the skin that pale ashy look if they're anemic. Index, a standard indicator of measurement or indices is just simply plural of index. Microcytic, microcytic, pertaining to a small cell. Cyto is a combining form that means cell. So micro means small, cyto means cell. I see it means pertaining to. Pallor, paleness of the skin. Plasma, fluid, non-cellular component of blood. Okay. Poikilocytic, poikilocytic. It's a pertaining to an irregular shaped red blood cell. I don't know why they called it a Blux cell. I guess that's a typo. I never noticed that till just now. And then finally, serum. Fluid remaining after removal of cells in the fibrin clot. Now, if you guys go on to the site and use those Learn Smarts, again, just like that little video that I created uh, earlier today, it's going to take you through all of this and it's gated. There are going to be questions that challenge you. And if you don't get those, if you miss enough of them during one of the little quizzes, it'll take you back and help you go through that material again and coach you up, so to say. So now we get into functions of the blood. Uh, it helps maintain homeostasis. Homeostasis is that narrow window of balance in the body where we function at our highest level. Uh, it helps maintain body temperature. If our temperature gets too low or too high, we deviate from homeostasis. Uh, the blood transports nutrients, vitamins, and minerals, transports waste products, uh, urea, bilirubin, lactic acid, creatinine. Those are all waste products transported by the blood. It transports hormones. All hormones get uh, released into the bloodstream from the various glands. It transports gases to and from the lungs and cells. Protects against foreign substances. Cells and chemicals in the body are an important part of the immune system. Our white blood cells are going to be our immune cells. Uh, it forms clots. Clots will be formed from some of those proteins that are found in the plasma. And then it also helps regulate pH and osmosis. Osmosis is going to be the passage, we scroll down just a little bit farther, is the passage of water through a selectively permeable membrane. Um, movement of something from an area of high concentration to low concentration, that's called diffusion. And our whole body thrives on diffusion, um, moving from an area of high content to low content. When I take a deep breath in and inhale atmospheric air, my alveoli extract the oxygen and that oxygen is in high amounts in my lungs, but low amounts in the bloodstream. So it goes downhill by diffusion. Oxygen goes right into the bloodstream. And we see that throughout our body. And osmosis is just movement of water from areas of high concentration of water to areas of low concentration. And that's how our kidneys work to filter our blood to make sure that ultimately we're getting out the waste material but just as importantly, maintaining water balance. Viscosity is the resistance of fluid to flow. If we have too little water in the body, those red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, and all those proteins have a tendency to want to form clots. There's not enough fluid for that material to move around through the vessels in. Okay, our word bank associated with the blood. Acid. Acid comes from the Latin term that means sour, but in our pH scale, an acid is something with a pH below 7. Um, the pH scale goes from 0 to 14, 1 being very, very acidic, whereas at the other extreme, 14 something very basic. 
something very acidic might be something like hydrochloric acid that's found in our stomach. Um, that helps break down food that we digest. Uh, it also breaks down pathogens that might get in our food. But on the other hand, something that's very basic, well, something that's very basic uh, or alkaline, alkaline and basic mean the same thing, it might be something that you encounter on a regular basis in your home like chlorine bleach. Um, oven cleaner, those are all extremely basic uh, or alkaline substances. Uh, and of course, alkaline is our next term. Substances with a pH above 7 and at the extreme end, 14. Anemia and anemic. Anemia means a decreased number of red blood cells. Uh, anemic means suffering from anemia or pertaining to or suffering from anemia. Buffer. Buffer comes from the Latin term cushion, and that's an apt term because a buffer is a substance that resists a change in pH. It's a balancer. It keeps things in balance. We don't want something being too acidic that disrupts homeostasis. We don't want something getting too alkalinic. That also can cause a deviation in homeostasis. Uh, creatinine, it's a breakdown product of the skeletal muscle protein creatine. Erythrocyte, another name for red blood cell. Homeostasis, stability or equilibrium of a system of the body's internal environment. Osmosis, the passage of water across a cell membrane. And remember, that crossing of the water across the cell membrane goes from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration until equilibrium is met. Sediment, insoluble material that settles to the bottom of a liquid. Sedimentation is going to be the formation of a sediment. Urea, the end product of nitrogen metabolism. And we typically think of urine as being largely composed of the waste product urea. Uh, viscous, sticky or resistant to flowing. Viscosity, the resistance of fluid to flow. And here's our red blood cell. And the main component of the red blood cell is hemoglobin, which gives the, the red uh, blood cell its red color. And if you look at figure 11-2, you'll see that the uh, red blood cell kind of looks like a Mentos candy. It kind of has that hollow dip there in the middle. And this biconcave appearance allows it to squeeze through capillaries in our body that are thinner than a hair. So that unique structure gives it the ability to get to every cell in our body. Our red blood cells transport oxygen. It transports carbon dioxide. That's the waste product of metabolism. Uh, it also transports nitric oxide. Uh, it's a, a, cell or excuse me, a gas produced by cells lining the blood vessels. It signals smooth muscles to relax. It's also a neurotransmitter. And one of the things about red blood cells is that red blood cells are produced in the bone marrow and they get rid of all of their organelles which would allow them to reproduce. And so that's why red blood cells only last about 120 days because they get rid of all of their intracellular components to hold as much hemoglobin as possible and therefore transport as much oxygen as possible. Okay, getting down to our word bank, biconcave, having a hollow surface on both sides of a structure. Erythroblast, pre precursor to a red uh, blood cell. Again, those are going to be found in the bone marrow. Erythropoiesis, formation of red blood cells. Erythropoietin, uh, protein secreted by the kidney that stimulates red blood cell production. Hematopoietic, pertaining to the making of red blood cells. Heme is the iron-based component of hemoglobin that carries oxygen. Macrophage. A macrophage is going to be a large white blood cell that removes bacteria. Think of a Pac-Man, a pathogen that gets into our body, gets engulfed, 
by a macrophage. It's a white blood cell that kind of acts like an intracellular Pac-Man. Oxyhemoglobin. Hemoglobin in combination with oxygen. It really makes the uh, hemoglobin glow when they're saturated with oxygen. Some disorders of the blood. Of course, anemia, a very common disorder, a reduction in the number of red blood cells. The red blood cells become hypochromic. And again, that's lacking red color. And it, People who are anemic are going to have poor endurance. They're going to have shortness of breath because there aren't as many red blood cells that are picking up oxygen and feeding their muscles, giving them the oxygen they need to keep working. So even very minimal tasks can make the patient short of breath. Iron deficiency anemia is just going to be... Uh, a lack of iron, therefore hemoglobin total will be low. Uh, pernicious anemia, different from iron deficiency anemia in that it's due to uh, lack of vitamin B12. We can actually synthesize B12 in our body, but we need something called intrinsic factor. And our body can produce this naturally, but if we don't have intrinsic factor, then we can't make vitamin B12. And so ultimately that leads to hemoglobin not being formed. And so people uh, over the years when they, get in, uh, when they have gotten tired, they would go to their doctor and get a B12 shot. And that was due to a particular type of anemia called pernicious anemia. Now, the next one, sickle cell anemia. Uh, again, it's a genetic disorder, more common in African-Americans, Africans, and some Mediterranean populations. But the big thing about that is look at figure 11.5 and see the sickle cell. You see a normal red blood cell with its biconcave appearance, the little cherry red looking mento, and then we see something that literally looks like the old sickle that they used to use to cut down grass. And that ultimately, as it's flowing through the very small vessels of our body, well, instead of just simply moving through the vessels like the normal biconcave red blood cell would, that sickle cell has a tendency to get caught, especially where a cell ultimately divides into two, called a bifurcation. And so what happens is if that blood cell, that sickle cell, gets to a place where the blood cell divides, it will typically get lodge partway in one and block the other side and then more and more of the sickle cells get in the way creating a lack of blood flow. Um, hemolytic anemia. Hemo, of course, we know means blood, but lytic, as we talked about before, means to break down. So hemolysis is occurring and red blood cells are being destroyed at a higher than normal uh, number. Aplastic anemia, the bone marrow is unable to produce a, a sufficient number of replacement red blood cells. Remember, our red blood cells only last about 120 days. They can't divide on their own. They can't go through the cell cycle like I talked about when I was talking about the uh, origin of cancer. So instead, Red blood cells have to be produced constantly by the bone marrow. Hemoglobinopathies, hemoglobin, uh, hemoglobinopathies include thalassemia, uh, sickle cell disease and thalassemia. Uh, those are all going to be uh, related to uh, lack of hemoglobin, which we said was uh, the part of the red blood cell that carries the oxygen. It binds with oxygen so it can be carried throughout the body. Okay, our word bank. Uh, associated with blood, agglutinate means to stick together to form clumps. Uh, that's how blood clots. If you take a drop of blood and place it on a slide and come back in a little while, it will agglutinate, it will form clumps. A plastic anemia, condition in which the bone marrow is unable to produce sufficient red blood cells, white blood cells and platelets. Hemoglobinopathy, disease caused by the presence of an abnormal hemoglobin in the red blood cells. Hemolysis and hemolytic, 
destruction of red blood cells so that hemoglobin is liberated, pertaining to the process of destruction of red blood cells, hypochromic, pale in color as in red blood cells when hemoglobin is deficient, hypoxia, hypoxic, okay, those both mean below normal levels of oxygen in tissues, gases, or blood, and hypoxic means deficient in oxygen. Incompatible, substances that interfere with each other physiologically. A macrocyte, a large red blood cell. Macrocytic, pertaining to macrocytes. Pernicious anemia, a chronic anemia due to lack of vitamin B12. Polycythemia vera, a chronic disease with bone marrow hyperplasia. That means an increase in the number of cells an increase in the number of red blood cells and in blood volume. Okay, polycythemia means overproduction. And thalassemia is a group of inherited blood disorders that produce hemolytic anemia and occur in people living around the Mediterranean Sea. White blood cells. Now, we said red blood cells carry oxygen and they uh, also carry carbon dioxide. Uh, they also serve in transporting nitric oxide, but the big two are carbon dioxide and oxygen transport. White blood cells, on the other hand, are going to be important for our protection. They protect us from pathogens. <clears throat> and they are divided into neutrophils. <clears throat> neutrophils are 50 to 70 percent of total white blood cell count. Uh, they're also called polymorphonuclear leukocytes. Poly means multiple, morpho means shape, and nuclear means nucleus. <clears throat> and AR means pertaining to. So pertaining to a multi-shaped nucleus. And if we look at those two cells uh, in 11.6, we can see uh, that type of distinct nucleus <clears throat> that has uh, multiple shapes to it. Uh, eosinophils make up 2-4% to 4 of white blood cells. They're going to be important in allergic responses. And as our uh, notes say, the number increases. Uh, the eosinophils increase with an allergic response. Basophils. Okay, normally less than 1% of the total white blood cell count. Okay, basophils are going to release heparin which prevents the blood from clotting. And what ultimately happens is that allows more blood to flow to that area that carries more white blood cells and therefore it protects the body. Okay, our white blood cell word bank, basophil. Okay, a basophil's granules attract a basic blue stain in the laboratory. That's where it actually gets its name. Uh, differential, a differential bl white blood cell count lists percentage of the different nuclei, uh, excuse me, different leukocytes in a blood sample. Eosinophil, and eosinophil's granules attract a rosy red color when staining. That's eosin is the stain used, and that's where the cell gets its name from. Granulocyte, a white blood cell that contains multiple small granules in its cytoplasm. Heparin, an anticoagulant secreted by liver cells. And of course, we use heparin as a drug in the medical field. Leukocyte is another name for a white blood cell. Leuco means white. Leukocytosis, so leukocytosis is an excessive number of white blood cells, whereas leukopenia is a deficient number of white blood cells. Neutrophil. A neutrophil's granules take up a purple stain, uh, equally whether the stain is acid or alkaline. Neutropenia, a deficiency of neutrophils. And then polymorphonuclear, white blood cell with a multi-lobe nucleus. Okay. We have more white blood cells. Pathogens come in many types, and so that's why our body has developed many types of pathogen fighters, which the white blood cells are. And so we have another class called A granulocytes. A in front of any word means no. 
So because monocytes and lymphocytes have no granules in their cytoplasm, they're called agranulocytes. And monocytes are the largest blood cell and normally are about 3 to 8% of the total white blood cell count. They will leave the bloodstream and become macrophages. And we already said those are like big Pac-Man cells that phagocytize bacteria. Phago means to eat or swallow. And they will destroy bacteria, dead neutrophils, and dead cells in the tissue. Lymphocytes are normally about 25 to 35 percent of the total white blood cell count. They're the smallest of the white blood cells. They're produced in the red bone marrow. And white, uh, excuse me, lymphocytes are going to differentiate into, uh, they're going to be found in different areas, but the lymphocytes are going to differentiate into T lymphocytes and B lymphocytes that we'll discuss here in just a minute. But ultimately, lymphocytes are going to move in the bloodstream to the lymph nodes, the tonsils, the spleen, and the thymus, and that's where they're going to fight pathogens. And again, they differentiate into B cells and T cells. B cells differentiate into plasma cells, and plasma cells are going to, when they encounter a pathogen, plasma cells will differentiate into cells which produce uh, antibodies, and another name for antibodies is an immunoglobulin. Antibodies are going to be specific to the pathogen encountered, and that's going to lead to um, our body destroying each pathogen with a specific antibody. T cells, T cells get their name because they are born in the bone marrow, but ultimately T cells migrate to the thymus gland and the thymus gland is where they mature or become immunocompetent, which means now they are mature and can destroy pathogens. One of the neat things that I like to point out to people about T cells is again, they originate in the bone marrow, but they migrate to the thymus gland and there are thymic hormones, thymosin, that cause them to mature to be able to fight pathogens. The thymus gland is its biggest during our formative years. If I'm a, a, a young person and I'm a, a growing up in a, a family that wants to homeschool me, and so from age, uh, well, from a neonate until age 18, I'm at home around just a few people, my mom and dad, my siblings, then when I go to college and decide I want to go to a big university and get out there and experience the world, because I've been so sheltered in many ways, but because I've been sheltered in terms of my development of immunity, I'm going to get sick with everything that comes down the pike. The reason why is because, again, that thymus gland produces T lymphocytes in their greatest number during our formative years. And the more we get exposed to, we keep memory of all those pathogens that we've been exposed to. And those T lymphocytes are still in our memory banks. And ultimately, our body reproduces them very quickly in large numbers and keep pathogens from even getting us sick. So somebody that goes to kindergarten and public school all the way through eight, uh, excuse me, through 12th grade, and then goes to a big university, they've been exposed to many, many people over the years throughout their formative years when that thymus gland can create the most T lymphocytes. And therefore, their immune system is going to be that much stronger in their adult years. Um, can, our uh, white blood cell word bank, a granulocyte, a white blood cell without any granules in its cytoplasm. Antibody or antibodies, protein uh, produced in response to an antigen. And again, you'll also hear those called immunoglobulins or immunoglobulins, the next term. Specific protein evoked by an antigen. So when one of my white blood cells is encountering a pathogen from an outside uh, source, that's a pathogen, a foreign invader, they create a specific antibody. Uh, lymphocyte, small white blood cell with a large nucleus.
are disorders of white blood cells, leukocytosis um, is going to be a white blood cell count of normal cells exceeding 10,000 per cubic millimeter. Again, vastly more white blood cells than normal would be leukocytosis. Leukemia, cancer of the hematopoietic tissues and produces a high number of white blood cells. Okay, so leukemia is a, a disease probably everyone has heard of. Uh, the leukocemic, uh, excuse me, leukemic cells uh, expand greatly their numbers, and that causes uh, a rise in white blood cell count. But it's different from the rise in white blood cell count that we see in uh, leukocytosis. Uh, leukocytosis, those cells are going to be normal white blood cells, whereas the leukemia uh, is going to have a different appearance to it. And we can see here a vastly different appearance in these white blood cells from uh, normal white blood cells. So that's a differentiation between leukemia and uh, leukocytosis. Myeloid leukemia characterized by uncontrolled production of granulocytes and their precursors can be acute or chronic. Uh, lymphoid leukemia characterized by uncontrolled production of lymphocytes. Okay, it can be acute or chronic. Acute lymphoblastic leukemia, most common form of childhood cancer uh, and is curable with modern treatments such as chemotherapy and bone marrow, bone marrow and umbilical cord stem cell transplant. Leukopenia results from when white blood cell counts drop below 5,000 cells per cubic millimeter. Uh, again, leukopenia is seen in viral infections such as measles, mumps, chickenpox, poliomyelitis, and AIDS. AIDS is so devastating because it wipes out one type of our uh, lymphocyte called the helper T cell. And I like to tell people that the name helper T cell, um, its technical name is a CD4 cell, but it's called a helper T cell because if a helper T cell encounters a foreign pathogen, it's not necessarily going to be the cell that destroys the pathogen like some of the other lymph, uh, white blood cells that we have. It literally does what its name implies. It calls for help. Hey, everybody come and run in. Whoever is best suited to destroy this pathogen that I've just run into, you take care of it. But you guys all come on over here and we'll sort it out later as to who's the best to destroy it. And HIV, when it manifests as AIDS, destroys the helper T cells. So now there's nobody to call for help. Pancytopenia occurs when the red blood cells and white blood cells are reduced in total number. And again, it says it can occur with chemotherapy. Chemotherapy, radiation can both lead to that. Um, those types of treatment are killing good cells as well as the cancer cells. Uh, aspiration, uh, removal by suction of fluid or gas from a body cavity. Heterophile, pertaining to antibodies present during a disease but not directed against the causative agent. Leukemia, disease in which the blood is taken over by white blood cells and their precursors. Leukemic, pertaining to having the characteristics of leukemia. Lymphoid, resembling lymphatic tissue. Mononucleosis, presence of large numbers of mononuclear leukocytes. Monospot test, uh, detects heterophile antibodies and in infectious mononucleosis. Myeloid, resembling cells derived from bone marrow. Pancytopenia, deficiency of all cell types, uh, deficiency of all blood cell types. Platelet thrombocyte, cell fragment involved in clotting process, or platelet or thrombocyte, I'm sorry. Precursor, cell or substance formed earlier in development of the cell or substance, and then the stem cell. Undifferentiated cell found in differential, uh, differentiated tissue that can divide to yield specialized cells in that tissue. And let me speak just a second on stem cells. This is where there's a lot of controversy about stem cell research. 
it's not just in uh, newborns or embryos that there are stem cells. Even in adults, we have stem cells. Um, we have um, hemocytic cells, uh, hemocytoblasts in our body, which are undifferentiated uh, blood cells, and they can differentiate into a platelet, a white blood cell, or a red blood cell in the bone marrow, depending on what the body's needs are. If I go to the Rocky Mountains to train because I'm an Olympic athlete, very quickly those hemocytoblasts will uh, create more red blood cells because that's what's needed because we're training at altitude. Whereas if I was in a uh, uh, disease state, these stem cells of the bone marrow would create more white blood cells to fill that need. Okay, hemostasis is just the controlling of bleeding. And I'm not going to get into great depth about uh, hemostasis, but that's going to be carried out by our platelets. Or the other name for platelet is thrombocyte. Thrombo means clot. So a thrombocyte literally means a clotting cell. Um, when somebody gets injured, we see that hemostasis, the stopping of blood, is a three-part uh, series. There's a vascular spasm. If somebody's injured, the vessels all constrict. That helps blood to keep, uh, to keep blood from being released in large volume. A platelet plug formation occurs. Uh, that basically means those proteins that are constantly circulating in our bloodstream kind of form a meshwork that ultimately um, is going to form a scab. And then finally, blood coagulation, uh, the process beginning with the production of molecules that produce prothrombin and thrombin, uh, fin finishing with the formation of a blood clot that traps blood cells, platelets, and tissue fluid in this network of fibrin. And so ultimately, tissue factors, clotting factors, and platelets convert thrombin to prothrombin that converts fibrinogen to a fibrin clot. And it, for lack of a better way to put it, is just simply a mesh, and that mesh traps white blood cells and more protein fibers, and ultimately that leads to connective tissue filling in where the injured area uh, lost tissue and new uh, connective tissue will form and then ultimately the uh, dermis and epidermis layer will heal that area and all of the uh, uh, protein fibers will be broken down by the body. Okay. And so our word bank, uh, continuing in this chapter, anticoagulant. A uh, substance that prevents clotting, and we talked about heparin being released by basophils earlier. Coagulant is a substance that actually induces clotting. Okay, so if we get injured, that's part of hemostasis. Coagulation, the process of blood clotting. Fibroblast, a cell that forms collagen fibers. Hemostasis, controlling or stopping bleeding. Megakaryocyte, a large cell with a large nucleus. Parts of the cytoplasm break off to form platelets. A platelet is a cell fragment involved in the clotting process. Also, we said we could call it a thrombocyte. Prothrombin, protein found, or excuse me, formed by the liver and converted to thrombin in a, a blood clotting mechanism. Thrombin, enzyme that forms fibrin. And then a thrombocyte, or platelet, another name for a platelet. Thrombus, a clot attached to a diseased blood vessel or heart lining. And then thrombosis is formations, formation of a thrombus. Okay, and then disorders of coagulation. Coagulopathies. Hemophilia. Um, a disease in which basically the person does not have their blood clot. Uh, von Willebrand disease, okay, deficiency of a specific protein of 
uh, called factor eight complex. It's different uh, from the part involved in hemophilia. So there are two different non-clotting disorders. Disseminated intravascular coagulation uh, occurs when the clotting mechanism is activated simultaneously throughout the cardiovascular system. The trigger is usually a severe bacterial infection. Small clots form and obstruct blood flow into tissues and organs, particularly the kidney, leading to renal failure. Okay, as the clotting mechanisms are overwhelmed, severe bleedings occur. Uh, severe bleeding occurs. Okay, thrombus formation, thrombosis, a clot that attaches to diseased or damaged areas of the walls of blood vessels of the heart. And part of the thrombus breaks loose and moves through the circulation. It's called an embolus. Okay, so a thrombus is a stationary clot, whereas an embolus is going to be a moving clot. That's why you will hear about so-and-so had a pulmonary embolism. And again, that was a moving clot that ultimately lodged in a vessel that was not large enough for that clot to move through. Thrombocytopenia. Okay, is a low platelet count. Okay, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura, and a anti, or excuse me, a hemolytic uremic syndrome or acute potentially fatal disorders in which loose strands of fibrin are deposited in numerous small blood vessels. This causes damage to platelets and red blood cells, causing thrombocytopenia and hemolytic anemia. Penic scoloin purpura, a disorder involving purpura, joint pain, and glomerulonephritis. Okay, etiology unknown. Etiology means the origin. So the origin of this disease, Henex scoloin, is going to be no underlying cause is known at this time. Purpura, bleeding into the skin from small arterioles that produce a larger individual lesion. Okay, and here we can see... Uh, purpura okay, and there's our word bank coagulotherapy disorder of blood clotting disseminate to widely scatter throughout the body or an organ embolus detached piece of thrombus a mass of bacteria quantity of air or foreign body that blocks a blood vessel Extravasate to ooze from a vessel into the tissues. Hematoma is a collection of blood that's escaped from the blood vessels into tissue. Hematoma literally means blood bruise, or excuse me, blood tumor. So when you get a bruise, that's a form of a tumor. Uh, hemophilia, an inherited disease from a deficiency of clotting factor eight. Again, it's going to lead to uncontrolled bleeding. Petechia or petechiae, which is plural, uh, pinpoint capillary hemorrhagic spot in the skin, purpura, skin hemorrhages that are red initially, then turn purple, recombinant DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid altered by inserting a new sequence of DNA into the chain, and that's how uh, A, the uh, HIV virus replicates itself. It literally alters uh, the cell's genetic material and inserts itself into that genetic material. Streptokinase, an enzyme that dissolves clots. Thrombocytopenia, deficiency of platelets in the circulating blood. And then warfarin, anticoagulant, also used as rat poison. But it's also used in the medical field a lot as Coumadin. And it is a very commonly used blood thinner. Red blood cell antigens, this is where we get into blood typing. And if we look at uh, our ABO group under uh, learning objective 1110, we see that we have a red blood cell and we've created a little antigen for it that looks like uh, a little letter V. And red blood cells that have the antigen A are going to have antibodies that are against antigen B. And if we look at the next picture, okay, and that's what gives us A blood. If we look at the next picture, we'll see 
a red blood cell with a little square marker, and we're referring to that as antigen B, antigen B will then mean that the cell has anti-A antibodies. That's why I can't give somebody with B blood type A. If I give them the A antigen, then I'm going to have those antibodies destroy the A antigen. Our third type, AB blood, has A antigen and B antigen, but no antibodies. You can't have antibodies for A if you have the A antigen on your outside. You can't have antibodies for B if you have the B antigen on your outside. So AB blood is the universal recipient. It can receive any type of blood, A, B, or O. Of course, AB as well. Now, finally, there's type O blood. And type O blood does not have any antigens, but it does have antibodies against A and B. So type O blood is the universal donor. It can go into anybody, but they can't accept anything but O blood. If you give them A blood, they have antibodies against A. If you give them B blood, they have antibodies against B. And of course, AB blood, well, those both are there. So it would destroy AB blood as well. Okay. Agglutination is a process by which cells or other particles adhere to each other to form lumps, uh, clumps. Autologous, blood transfusion from the same person as donor and recipient. Some religions may not permit people to accept blood transfusions. And so they would need an autologous blood transfusion of their own blood. Infusion, introduction intravenously of a substance other than blood. Transfusion is transfer of blood or a blood component from donor to recipient. Now, this is one other antigen, the RH antigen. If somebody is termed RH positive. What exactly does it mean if they are termed an RH positive blood uh, type? Well, if somebody is RH positive blood type, what that means is that they have the RH antigen. So their blood cells would literally have the RH antigen on their cell membrane. Now, there's no such thing as an RH negative antigen. If somebody is RH negative, they just don't have the RH antigen. So, RH positive means they simply have the RH antigen attached to their cell membrane. RH negative means no RH antigen. Okay, so that's what's meant by RH positive and RH negative. And originally, the RH came from rhesus monkeys. So the research that they did on the rhesus monkeys is what ultimately gave them the name RH. Now, in, in females, RH is something very important when it comes during pregnancy. If an RH negative woman and an RH positive, excuse me, RH positive man conceive an RH negative child, the placenta normally prevents uh, maternal and fetal blood from mixing. So during the first pregnancy of an RH positive male and an RH negative female, if they have an RH negative child, it's not that big of a deal. The placenta isolates 
the developing fetus, and so ultimately there's no harm done. But during the actual delivery, fetal cells can enter the mother's bloodstream. Now, Rh positive cells stimulate the mother's uh, tissues to produce Rh antibodies. So if this Rh negative woman now has antibodies in her against the Rh antigen because the blood from the fetus when the birthing process was occurring mixed with the female's blood that leads to antibodies against the Rh antigen and if the woman gets pregnant a second time with an Rh positive fetus this Rh negative woman will have developed antibodies against the Rh antigen and it will ultimately destroy the fetus. Okay, we call that hemolytic disease of the newborn or erythroblastosis fatalis. Now, in this day and age in the United States, um, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, Rogram uh, can be prescribed to make sure that these RH incompatibility issues are overcome. In less well-developed countries where prenatal care is little or non-existent, that's where erythroblastosis fatalis may still occur. And so our word bank for uh, uh, our antigens, our ABO, uh, excuse me, A and B antigens, as well as our RH antigens, um, consists of erythroblastosis, hemolytic disease of the newborn due to RH incompatibility. I should have said erythroblastosis fatalis. Infusion, introduction of intravenous, introduction intravenously of a substance other than blood. Rhesus factor, an antigen or red blood cells of RH positive individuals. It was first identified in the blood of a rhesus monkey. Spherocyte, a spherical cell and spherocytosis, presence of a spherocyte in the blood. All right, so there is chapter 11. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Okay, good.